All right. The floor All is right. yours. Man, bonita Zarillo has time. Uh, I'm a city councillor in the city of Coquitlam and thank you Amir for the invite and lovely to hear everyone's background already because I can already pivot my talk today to scientists, which is incredible because I'm a business analyst myself so it's a different way of presenting. Uh, nice to see the Coquitlam residents here. And also I wanted to say that my one of my nieces works at Natural Factors. Sherry Officer, you probably know her. She's been there a long time. Yeah, that's my niece. So there you go. Amazing how we are so connected to, you know, networks are so amazing. So I'm gonna ask Amir if you wouldn't mind just keeping me on track for timing tonight. Should, uh, when should okay. I when should I bring my uh, uh, hammer? <laughs> yeah. How do you like to usually open for questions? Like, do you want me to do a little bit of storytelling and then do questions, or how would you like the flow to go? Yeah, we 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 start with like a fifteen minute uh, chat talk from you, and then we go into questions and discussions. And we just we were just joined by Taha, so okay. Taha wants. Do you want to introduce yourself? Ta, can you hear us? Ta, okay. Ta cannot hear us. Uh, Ruzbe just joined us as well. Ruzbe, can you in, uh, introduce yourself? Tell us what you do, if you can hear us. Okay, uh, neither one of them can hear us. Uh, Bonita, you have the floor. All right. So there's a saying out there in the business community that uh, a company's culture will eat their strategy for lunch. And some of you might have heard it before. It's a famous concept attributed to uh, Peter Drucker, who's in many of the business schools. Obviously, his, his words and his work is in many business schools. Uh, he's the well-known management consultant that's trained many a CEO. Um, the actual quote, if you've heard it before, is culture eats strategy for lunch. So when Amir was asking me for a topic, um, what popped into my mind was the idea that um, relationships eat culture for lunch. So I'm sitting in front of a lot of scientists right now, and we like data and we like facts, but we understand that every piece of data and every fact needs to have uh, an interpretation. Uh, usually from a human, uh, unless you're doing artificial intelligence, but there is the idea that even that roots from a human. So when I uh, started working in government, it was very different from my science world. So the, the, the quote that inspired me was culture eats strategy for lunch. And the meaning of that quote is that no matter how good your corporate strategy is, if it's not created in a corporate culture where the employees accept that strategy, they actually have the power to ensure that that strategy never comes to life. So in local governments, because I spent the most of my career in uh, business, when, when I came into local government, I felt that that concept was actually the opposite in local government. And I say it like this, relationship, relationships eat equity for lunch. And what I mean by that is that no matter how much a local government might strive for equity or um, an elected official might stand for equity, today, in today's world, relationships still rule. So that old saying, it's who you know, is definitely still true in local government. And in my opinion, uh, I think it needs to stop because it continues to limit the progress on equity uh, by keeping this insiders or perpetuating this insiders and outsiders. That has been my experience. So I believe it's up to elected officials to make room for those new voices to build relationships with people um, outside of their traditional community groups or outside of those traditional voices that are in the hallways of power already that make the decisions and to empower other groups to speak out and to create space for those missing voices at the table. Uh, my sister recently became the uh, provost at Royal Roads University in Victoria and uh, she 
mentions to me often and she's been quoted to say it is to just you know poke those uh poke those those power those power brokers and uh question them so i believe in that and uh so i'm just going to give you some of my experiences today in my seven years in local government i'm going to talk about how to get elected how to stay elected and potentially how to bring people along or to bring the next uh, stage along so um, right now only 30 percent of government uh, local government are women so that's a big portion of the work that I do is uh, focused on women. I do it also in my personal volunteer life as well. Um, but I thought I would just start by letting you know my background and then I'll move right into my how to get elected, how to stay elected and, and how to bring someone along. So Amir, do you want me to just go ahead with that or do you want me to? Yep, go yeah. for it. Okay, so I uh, moved to Coquitlam in 2010, in the summer of 2010. Um, I followed my husband's career for the majority of my married life. And he was transferred all over North America. So we ended up in Montreal three times, Toronto twice, Texas once. I've lived in Edmonton, Calgary. I was born in Saskatchewan, went to the University of Manitoba. I lived overseas in England for a few years. And I also lived in Pakistan in the late 80s, early 90s for a very short period of time. So I've kind of been everywhere. And in the spring of 2010, my husband's mom had a stroke and she lives in Coquitlam. So he decided that he wanted to come and spend some time with his mom. He wanted the kids to know his mom and dad better. Uh, he wanted to be here. So that's how we ended up in Coquitlam in the summer of 2010. So me being the, the mother in the, in the, in the uh, equation, uh, I had always found new work everywhere that I went. And because I was in technology, I have a degree in sociology from the University of Manitoba, but I also have a computer science degree from CDI, which I began uh, back in the, in the 1990s when I moved to Montreal the first time. And language was an issue for me because I didn't speak French well enough then. So data I could do. Um, so when we moved here, I was again put in that position where I needed to find work. And I found work downtown Vancouver. I was working for a, a market research company. And I was racing back to Coquitlam every evening to try to make sure to get back for daycare. And uh, one day I just thought, you know, this is this is just ridiculous. Why is there no local work? Why is there no local work for working parents? So it inspired me to run for council. So I very naively uh, decided I'm just going to run for council. It was the 2013 by-election, which meant someone had uh, moved on to a different level of government and there was a space open. And I decided I was going to run for council. I, I had some community. Sorry, uh, I don't know what happened. Bonita, are you still with us? Any connections? But I Sorry, you were cutting out. Yeah. Am I back yet? Yes, you're back. Am I back yet? Sorry yes. about that. I'm actually, I'm, I actually wanted to hook into the um, Ethernet today. So I came down, but then I realized that my computer doesn't have an Ethernet <laughs> connection, this computer I'm on. So I'm sorry if I wave in and out here, but I am in the best internet location in the house. Maybe you go back to 2013 and then yeah, so 2013, I decided to run for I decided to run in a by election. So naively me, I thought, well, you know, it's it's open, it's open, it's equitable, it's free, anybody can run, and as long as you do the work, I have a chance of winning. So I went to see some of the local elected officials in the city, and and they kind of gave me a bit of a like, um, you know, it's never going to happen, right? It's never going to happen. You're you don't have the backing of any local elected officials and uh but you do have one chance and your one chance is because it's a by-election if you can go and meet with the union you might be able to get their support and you might be able to get elected so it was quite funny because at that time i didn't even know what 
the who the union was, what the union was in the community. So long story short, um, I started to do that work in the community of aligning myself with some elected officials. And I did reach out to the union and I did start to build some relationships there. And fortunately, one of the local uh, politicians in the area had also a mission to open up the power, uh, the hallways of power, the decision making to open it up to wider voices. And so I kind of got taken under the wing of one of the uh, elected officials and they partnered me with uh, a, a person named Chris Wilson who was well known in the community. And um, that's kind of how the by-election happened. And I had to work really hard. And I say to anybody that's out there wanting to get elected, no matter what your relationships are like, you can't get elected without knocking on doors. So I think this pandemic has probably created, as it has with many things, a bit of an unequal playing field for people that actually can't get out and knock on doors. But I'll put that to the side right now and just say that it took a lot, a lot, a lot of door knocking and a lot of work. But I realized very early that it, if I didn't have the relationships, it was really, really, really hard. So that was uh, that was that was getting elected. And um, I guess at this point, I just wanted to if if any of you are thinking of wanting to get into the field of local government or any level of government, but I think it's more poignant for local government because you rely on yourself more than a leader, um, you know, to start making those connections in the community. For me, I had joined the local parent advisory committee, but, you know, get to know your local politicians, the local leads in your sports organizations, definitely the NGOs in your community that align with your values and door knock, door knock, door knock. So that's my story on get elected. So as I, uh, as I maybe need to go back to is when I got elected, I thought it would be very much like my business life. I'd spent 20 years in consumer goods across North America, working in organizations that were structured and that used fact-based decision and science-based decision. And so when I got elected, I assumed that that would just translate over to elected government. And what I found when I got elected was that the environment was very much about subjective interpretation and relationships. So although I definitely realized that those relationships were important to get elected, I didn't realize how much that would be important once I got involved because I assumed that fact-based decision-making would be in play. So I think um, if there's been a challenge in being an elected official and staying an elected official is the environment of local government. And I'm not sure if it plays at other levels of government, but certainly in local government, it's each person for yourself and you are in competition with all of the other people that you work with around the council table because there's no parties, there's no uh, wards in BC. There's, it's basically a, a very competitive environment, which I'm not sure is the greatest uh, for policy making, but certainly it's the environment that you will find yourself in an elected government. So as uh, someone who uh, wanted to poke the status quo, it wasn't well received. It wasn't necessarily well received. And what I found was that the decision making, as I said, was very subjective and very much based on who you know, and who's phoned you that day and wants to be heard or who's emailed or who has the most influence in the community as far as voting blocks, um, 
though all of those factors uh, um, play into the decision making of local elected officials. So it was my job to make sure that I had the community's interests front and center in all of my decision making and that I was out there a lot in the community meeting people seeing people listening to people and as much as I could I really tried to raise the voices of um, community members that weren't as uh, prevalently heard so for example I'm, I'm often advocating for needs of women and girls in the community they um, they often don't get as much budget assigned to their needs, uh, even in sports or recreation, we don't see as much. Uh, but I'm also uh, looking out for persons with disabilities. I've, I've been the chair of the Universal Accessibility Committee for many, many years. And I really, um, really, really like that work. And one of the, I don't know, I've got, there's a couple of Coquitlam residents here. I remember a few years ago, about four or five years ago, the city banners, um, depicted a person in a wheelchair and I was just that's just such a big move um, for people to be able to see themselves in their city so that was another area that I very much uh, got involved with um, it's very very important that you stay close to your electorate when you get into um, local government especially if you are one of the outsiders when you know, not in the insider group, but on the outsider group, one of those people that's pushing the status quo. And I say that because it, it does wear on you uh, emotionally, mentally, uh, it's difficult. So um, getting close to your community, using your community as your fan club, um, championing the needs of your community can be very, very rewarding, but it's also very important for your own mental health and and to, and to keep you motivated and to keep keep you in the in the good headspace. So one of the examples is in Coquitlam a few years ago, there was a decision made to take the curling rink away from Poirier Sports and Rec and to replace it and uh, with a with a hockey rink or with a skating rink. And the curlers, um, you know, it's a smaller group. It's an older group. And it is, uh, it is a, a sport that can be done um, uh, for persons with disabilities. And there is quite a large group of persons with disabilities that, that use that space. And so I, I really felt that it, it wasn't right. I, I really felt that to take that service away, um, even though it's a service that they felt, you know, didn't have a big enough return on investment as far as, um, uh, optimizing the use of space it was important to the community and I got a lot of I got a lot of flack for that from my uh, my elected colleagues and uh, I I had to really reach out to the community I really had to really go with the community for support on that I had to really uh, verify with the community that you know what I was what I was standing for and what I was doing was right and that really kept me through that time uh, to feel strong and to be able to weather the storm that came after it. So the moral of my story there is, you know, you got to you got to stay true to your values, and you've got to reach out to your community to help you to stay strong and, and to to stay true to those values because it can be very very easy to fold into the status quo. And if there's so many of us now and so many people doing work on equity and, and understanding how important it is to have a diversity of voices and how much better decision making is when you have diversity of voices um, that it's important that you that you that you have the support externally if you come into local government because internally it's going to be harder to find so uh, the last point i just wanted to talk about was just helping helping the person behind you and, and certainly when you first get elected I mean, you're, you're, you're treading water to stay afloat yourself, but I think once you have uh, created a, a space in the community, once you have gained the trust of, of, of members of the community, once you've reached out and made those connections and those relationships, and you've got those networks going, uh, you can certainly start think about, thinking about helping others. So one of the things I've really wanted to do in that space, and I'm going to focus on women here, 
is to get more women um, in the bureaucratic roles inside City Hall. So I noticed when I got elected that it was very, um, it was very top heavy on um, one voice. There wasn't a lot of women at the top. And there was a recent study that just came out. I think the Globe and Mail just finished it. So you might've seen it on the news last night. The Globe and Mail just talked about it, how uh, they, they went into these uh, public administration uh, forums to find out about the wage gap and what they found was the power gap. And if you if you wanted to look into this a little bit more, uh, you can take a look at that release this week from the Globe and Mail. But what they found was a power gap where where women they were not able to to break into those really high levels like city managers, deputy city managers, general managers, the ones that were really driving the agenda and making the decisions inside. So it's been my uh, work to try to elevate that conversation, to point out that conversation um, through one of the NGOs that I work with. I uh, have gone, done a few uh, gender equity events, but we did one specifically for public administrators a few years back in New Westminster and just uh, talked about how, what are some of the tools and tricks to raise uh, get more women's voices around those decision making tables and levels inside administration. Um, it, it, it was great to um, have men in the room in that conversation talking about how to help move that along. Uh, tips like, you know, hire in pairs or um, promote in pairs so that they have uh, sounding boards. So that's the work that I really think is important because if we're not inside, we can't change the narrative if we're not inside. And yes, local government officials have a lot of, they have a lot of power. Um, they do. But as all of us know here that our scientists that work in data, it can be presented, the story can be presented in the way it wants to be presented, and you can always find the data to present that story. So if public administration wants something one way, they will present, they can present the story that way, they can create uh, data and fact points that way. So I, I think it's really important to have that wider perspective of, of women uh, inside public administration too. So I was happy to say at the uh, last year at the city of Coquitlam, uh, we had tipped the scales on uh, having many more women at the ge general management level. Uh, unfortunately, we, won we, we lost one of our uh, GMs recently, but uh, to another city, but uh, certainly that's work that I think is, is very important. So kind of why I appreciate Amir inviting me here today too, is that I think it's always important um, to connect, to, to keep growing your network. Uh, I have three girls, uh, age 17 to 31. And I keep saying to my girls, if I had known when I would use your age, how important networks were, I would have been working them way more. I didn't, I didn't realize till I was 40 um, how important these networks are and that opportunities are attached to people. So the more people you know and the more people you see and the more people you talk to about your goals or projects that you're working on, the more um, people can help you. So in that topic of, of helping people behind you, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to reach out. I'm trying to hear people's stories too, um, to connect people if I can, if I know two people that are working on a project or three people. Um, that, that's, what I, uh, that's what I like to do and that's what I'm doing here today. So that's kind of my story in a nutshell and I was hoping to hear some of the stuff that the group here is working on and also if you've got some questions or you wanted to speak specifically about one point or another i'm, I'm here for questions uh thank you bonita uh that was uh very uh uh, in, uh inspiring i would say uh before we get to questions we had a uh, we had the sara sagai and ashkan saidi also joining us sara can you introduce yourself 
Jeez, nobody likes to be introduced tonight. Sorry, Hi. just give us like I'm actually on my phone. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna talk without video. Uh, hi, sorry, I got here late. Nice to hear uh, Bonita uh, telling telling uh, you know, these interesting stories about how city halls function, which I kind of know a few things about. <laughs> so um, yeah, solidarity on all those struggles. Um, I, yeah, sorry, what did you want me to talk about? Introduce yourself. Tell oh, us right. You. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so I, I do a bunch of housing related work here in uh, Vancouver with the tenants union. I worked on uh, the COPE election uh, in 2018 to get in Swanson elected to City Hall. And this, I guess, housing struggles is sort of is the, the area that I've spent most of the last five or so years on. Um, I also teach computer science on the side. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Ashkan? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Ashkan. Um, I'm sorry. As soon as, I mean, when I just got connected, uh, then I got a message from my boss. So, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm a data scientist working in Vancouver. And I'm so excited to be here. Sorry, I missed a part of your talk, but I hope that I can uh, learn something from the questions and answers. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Ta or Ruzbe, you, you guys want to go too, or you want to do it later? I don't know if you can hear us. Hello, everyone. This is Taha. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just a UBC student doing uh, educational studies, uh, PhD. Uh, not finishing my thesis very soon. <laughs> and then, more than that, a fan of Bonita, also living in Kukitla. And yeah, I wish all NDP people were like Amir and Bonita. Well, thank you for uh, your endorsement, Taha. Uh, Ruzbe, you want to say a few things? Hi, everyone. That was very amazing experiment. And thank you for sharing that. I really uh, loved your like, path that you followed because I have uh, years of experience in working with communities to raise the voice of the unheard communities and uh, your passion and your trajectory that was very inspiring for me thank you for sharing that and uh, thank you Amy, for having such a interesting session thank you Ruzbe uh, can you t uh, also tell us what you do or what your expertise are uh, actually I'm an engineer nice. uh, but I worked for years with uh, uh, citizens, especially the minorities in different cities. Uh, and I also worked with uh, SDG program in UN, uh, but not in Vancouver, in Germany. And that's why your experience about the minorities and this session uh, was very interesting for me. But now in Vancouver, as you know, I'm a pretty newcomer. Yes. That's why I'm just learning and looking forward to uh, opportunity to work with community and with coronavirus situation, you know, it's such a difficult uh, environment to volunteer or work with communities by staying at home. But I wish and I'm looking forward. Thank you, Uzbejan. It's, it's great to connect with you after such a long time especially <laughs> after all the plans that were derailed because of COVID. Uh, so before we get to the questions, uh, we do our group photo. Uh, so if you want to be in the photo, please turn your camera on. And uh, yeah, we'll take the group photo and go from there. Everybody ready? Uh, three, two, one. Awesome. Ta, you are late. Okay, one, we, we do one more time with Ta. 
Uh, and somebody left. One, two, and three. Okay. Awesome. Uh, questions and comments? Uh, uh, Aisan has her hand up, and because she's from Coquitlam, she gets uh, special treatment. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. So I wanted, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your great talk. I wanted to talk about the problems that we have as an immigrant, but when you talked about your experience, I feel like you had the same experiences. I, I do not need to share with you how it is difficult to find your place in a new community, how it is I difficult. I you're cutting to... out. I don't know what's going on. Oh, can, can you... you hear me? Yes. I'm now. hearing I'm hearing it well, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. If, can you hear me, yeah? Yes. Okay, good. So I, wa I wanted to say that I know that you have experienced the same difficulties because you told us that you went to like Montreal, you had to learn French and you, ha you went to other countries. And so the thing is that when you are immigrant in one country, it's very hard to create those relationships. It's very hard to find people who can help you to just uh, find a better place in the society. Most of us, we are like highly educated. We are... We, we have the skill set, but we literally have no connections. And it takes so much time to find people who can help us to find better job, jobs that are like kind of equivalent to our education level and our skill set level. So my first question is that uh, what are the practical tips, uh, how we should create these relationships, how we should find uh, people who can help us grow better? So. If you have any practical tips for us, that would be really appreciated. And the second part of my question is that how you manage to like uh, find your place in each one of these uh, positions? Because you told us that you uh, went from one job to another job, and again you had to find a job in a new in a new country or in a new place. So how you manage to? Uh, like facilitate your path through these uh, different jobs and different positions. So any practical tips would be really appreciated. Thank yeah. you. Well, thank you so much for that question. And yeah, I mean, jobs, number one, right? Like I know jobs are number one. So I know, you know, we talk about, oh, well, you should get to know community and you should volunteer and you should do this and you should do that. And the reality is, and I understand it, we're busy paying mortgages, we're busy paying rents. We have a lot of times have children that we have to look after and we really just need work. So I, I think that um, if I could have any tips, it's about meet as penny people people as Bonita, I guess you're cutting out again. As you can. As you can. We lost okay. you for a second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Am I back? Yeah. Yes. yes. I'm getting your internet connection is unstable. So sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, I, it, I understand that it's definitely about work. Can I think if there's a business, just speak to everybody. Uh, you're cutting out again. Uh, you just can you see me yet? We can see you. You were frozen, and now it shows uh, free red bars. Oh, now now it's free white bars be beside your name. So I think it's good for now at least. Go, go ahead. Yeah, you okay? Yes. Yeah. So the, the 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 tip is to tell as many people. You know, whether you're. I mean, I was fortunate because I had I had kids. And kids help build community because you go to school, there's an access point there, you talk to teachers, you talk to other parents, you can sign them up for swimming lessons and you'll on the side of the pool, you can talk to someone. I guess I would say every opportunity where you are meeting someone, let them know what you're, let, let them know your goal, share your story. The more people that you can tell that you know you need work. You're looking for work. You're finishing school, and you're going to be looking for work. Um, that's that's something. It's hard. I know it's hard to do it, but the more people that know, people want to help. 
So that would be one of my tips uh, that I that I know. But the other thing that I do know is that it's it's very difficult to break in. It is an insider's group. It really is. There is a hundred years of structure there of uh, what we value as a society. And this is one of the things that I champion or I, you know, talk about all the time is like there's certain, there's certain profiles of people that we value. There's certain jobs that we value. There's certain attributes that we value. And it's, it's, it's hard to break out of those, but the only way right now to break out of it is relationships is you have to, but I wouldn't put it on you to join a bunch of clubs or have to volunteer. I think it's really just about in your everyday life, let people know that you're looking for work and that you, you know, that you, that you, you need a connection. And, you know, it is one of the disappointments of my time on city council. When I first got elected, I really wanted the city to redo its procurement policy. I really wanted it to go with the local clause. I wanted them to look at, you know, under $25,000, any work under $25,000 that they would open it up to the community. And, you know, the, 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 the answer back to me was that, you know, they have these policies in place, it is open already, but I think there's really a lack of understanding of how important a city contract would be to a new arrival, an immigrant, someone that's new in a career, to be able to put on their resume, even if it was a one-time project with the city, to be able to put that on their resume. And, and I'm still, you know, I'm still pushing for that because I do think it's it's something that needs to be done. I mean, the city has so much opportunity to help its residents to fill out their resumes and to make, make connections. So Ison, what was your second question? Because I started rambling there. I, and... <laughs> no, I think you made your point. I got like my answers. That was great, thank you. I think both of you answered both of them together so that's yeah. great thank but you. i just i think there is a lot of pressure right there's a lot of pressure for new arrivals to 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 volunteer and to mm -hmm. you know get out in this community well well you know you're tired you're trying to find a a doctor a dentist you're trying to sign your kids up for all kinds of lessons you're trying to get accustomed to a home and set up a house and you know your partner is looking for work as well i mean there's just so much to do it that's an added pressure yeah, that's that's totally right and the thing is that it's just not uh this is not our problem only for our first years of arrival the thing is that even at later stages when we are like more stable when we are graduated when we want to for example work uh, look for managerial jobs or for higher level managerial positions these problems continues to grow because still relationships play the main role yeah. still if you are phd graduate if you have done your postdoc even if you want you are a university professor still you need to get connected to the real power uh, real people who have power and relationships and it's hard it's not just only about the first years it continues to grow throughout our lifetime so we have to find better ways to <laughs> find our place <laughs> And that's so true. And that's why you just need to talk to as many people as you can talk to. You just never know who in a grocery store, who at the, the, the swimming pool has that connection because that is unfortunately the way society is still working right now. Oh, I have, you know, my nephew, my, my, you know, neighbor, you know, is I, and then you, your, your resume can, you, your resume, resume can be in your qualifications can be better. As soon as someone says, hey, my son's looking for work, um, all that goes out of the window. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Mariam, your turn. Thanks, Bonita, for uh, the great talk. It was amazing to hear from your experiences. And um, my question. Uh, so um, politics is kind of like a game. I'm wondering um, how um, do you um, 
like what have been your strategies to deal with um stresses or like if you feel overwhelmed if um some something is against your values or uh, how have you tried to push the idea and your value um the, um, if it makes sense um and the second one is um what is your experience around uh, bureaucracy and uh, frustrations with um, translating policy into practice mm -hmm. so uh, equally great um questions so uh, unfortunately the the idea of um i'm going to start with the second one first the, the policies you know un unfortunately policies don't need to be adhered to if the power group is enough that they can vote against adhering to them right so all of us saw the elected officials that decided to go on holidays during the pandemic when the rest kind of of stayed behind but uh, you know i'm going to put another example out there which is in the city of coquitlam we have a noise bylaw uh construction noise bylaw which isn't being adhering to right now because the construction lobby said they wanted to be able to to work later uh, during COVID. But what it didn't do was it didn't it didn't take into consideration the shift workers, the nurses, the 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 teachers, the people that are working at home that need that piece for their for their peace of mind. So um, I think one of the things you you nailed it with one of the things that I'm really struggling with right now to push 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 on the status quo and that is to enforce the policies, the laws, the equity. Um, the equity agreements that we make as a city government, we make the to me a bylaw or a policy is an equity agreement we've agreed that this is fair. And then when we don't enforce that that's an issue. And that's to me that's poking right on the problem around relationships, because if you can get in a, in a, in a council of nine if you can get five to get together to say well i'm going to set that policy aside or i'm going to set that bylaw aside based on some subjective. Uh, decision that they've made that 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 hurts equity, so I think that's really work that needs to be done, but I think it plays everywhere in life right there's rules, but what are you supposed to do if they're not being enforced right um and then the first the first part of it just around administration you were asking me about city city halls yes yeah um you know i i think it just goes back to these these structures these institutional powers were not built by the majority they were built by the minority for the protection of the minority and i think that we have a lot of of progressive thinking very well educated administrators that are coming through and 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 rising up into the ranks but we still have a very strong contingent in city halls of um legacy thinking that's stopping progress so i think we're on the precipice and i think covid has really identified how some of this legacy thinking and systems and institutions aren't serving people well anymore. And I'm really glad to see so many uh, voices externally from the community questioning that and shining light on that. And transparency is a great tool to achieve the policy uh, enforcement that we talked about to shine a light on the need for some of these legacy systems to go bye bye <laughs> to go by the wayside and i think that's why it's so important for community members like everyone on this call to call for transparency to force transparency to really make elected officials accountable to transparency too much happens in closed doors uh, in secret in my opinion thank you Thank you, Mariam. The question was on the spot, uh, on the dot. Um, yeah, um, Bonita, before we get to the next question, um, basically, um, 
you know, where we come from, uh, a lot of times uh, we have a very centralized uh, system. So it's not a federal system. So we have the, you know, the government that appoints the governors of provinces and, uh, you know, the city councils uh, and the civic governments, they have some autonomy, but at the end of the day, they're getting appointed by uh, the central government. So what is the jurisdiction? Like what, what is your, your job as a city councilor and what do you do in, uh, if you want, if you can say it in like, I don't know, one minute or two minutes and uh, why does it matter? <laughs> yeah. Um, good question. I like the way you said, say it in a minute or two. I think that city government is going the same way that society is going, where all levels of government are kind of meshing together. So I use an analogy like I came from the grocery industry. I, I started my whole career is basically around food. And about 10 years ago, the pharmacies started getting into food and food uh, started getting into housing, household goods, like all of a sudden, just this melting pot of um, sharing jurisdiction, right? It was no longer you just go to the grocery store for food, and you just go to the pharmacy for prescriptions, and you just go to Canadian Tire for your automotive. And I think the same thing is happening in government. Local government, I believe, was initially really um, about roads and streets, no values. It wasn't really values based, right? It was about keeping infrastructure in place. And I, I believe that today in our society now, that local government is actually about reflecting the values of the community. There is a social responsibility and it was it Sarah that's doing housing there is a social responsibility for us to start actually thinking about the build, the communities that we're building and how we're building them and how we can influence the housing and the right time of type of housing and how we can influence the transition to Ison's um, comments about how to integrate or how to get plugged in. How do we make sure that the programs that we're running, even if they're not the most subscribed programs, that we're actually reaching every corner of the community. So I, I think that the role of local government is changing and it's becoming um, more integrated with those provincial and federal and even um, First Nation governments. Uh, awesome. Um, another thing I would like to add uh, to as an additional question, as a supplemental question is, uh, you know, you are a counselor in Coquitlam. And I mean, when I talk about Coquitlam, I, uh, I never lived there, but I campaigned there. By the way, how many people live in Coquitlam other than ISON? <laughs> about 145,999 other ones. Uh, well, that, a, yeah, it's just over 145,000. Uh, I mean, on this, uh, on this uh, uh, call, uh, how many others do we have uh, oh sorry i thought you were asking me population yeah actually <laughs> maybe uh yeah actually we have taha and i think uh yeah that's pretty much it uh but uh yeah we have a huge community there but uh when i think of coquitlam i mean my idea is that you know they were like when i first came to canada 2005 we were talking about it as suburbia and uh, I don't know, at this point, I think there is a kind of a transition that's, we can't really think of Coquitlam as this sleepy suburbia anymore. It's uh, different now. And it's not quite, you know, like Vancouver, but it's somewhere in between. And uh, with that comes- uh, I mean, I Coquitlam has the, as much as I know, has the second uh, most, population of uh, Persians, Iranians in it. So first yes. is North Vancouver, and the next is Kukuitlam. So there yes. are so many people from our community who are living in Kukuitlam now. Yes, that is totally true. And uh, I, I totally agree with that. And data actually uh, uh, agrees with you without getting into too, too much details on that. But yeah, how do you see, how do you see that transition being uh, a counselor in for eight years now? Yeah, well, it's definitely becoming an urban center. 
And just to go back about the data, one of the first things I did when I got elected was, of course, take the census data and start doing benchmarking to fund to understand what does my community look like. And back in 2014, when I first got elected, I could see very clearly that Port Moody was very um, entrepreneurial. It was younger. It had a lot of um, creative uh, persona as far as even jobs, entrepreneurial jobs. And Coquitlam was very white collar very traditional workforce they left the community to work lots of engineers we over index for engineers in coquitlam and then you have port coquitlam which was a lot more blue collar a lot more trades i i found that really really interesting um so yeah coquitlam has become definitely an urban center and when i think about my experience when i lived in toronto you know mississauga was right there oakville was right right there after that it was all toronto uh, same with Montreal. There's Montreal, but then there was West Island. I lived on the West Island, but I also lived on the South Shore. Like it's it's all Montreal, urban Montreal. And I think the same, I, I visualize Co Coquitlam similarly that it's really, it is greater Vancouver now. It is an urban center and it's definitely growing at a very quick rate and almost too quick for um, long-term Coquitlamites to really be able to uh, navigate that uh, well. Awesome. Well, uh, now I think uh, it's. Uh, oh, Sarah, go for it. Yes, thanks so much. Um, I have two questions. It was actually interesting, Bonita, what you just said about uh, Coquitlam being white collar uh, predominantly, because I was just going to ask you. Um, one thing that I guess is just related to the previous question uh, about what is the city city's jurisdiction specifically, one thing that is, I guess, really hot in, uh, in BC and probably all over Canada is the issue of housing, specifically zoning, which is um, the exclusive uh, power that the city has. Um, so I was going to ask you, uh, how do you deal with the nimbism, which is something that I imagine you probably have a lot of in Coquitlam? Um, so that's my first question. The second question is, what do you think of wards uh, in Vancouver? It's been this has been a long-standing fight. Whether you know we should. We should get sorry, that large system. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. Can you explain warts uh, to our audience uh, what you mean by that? Yeah, I, I can, but I can also just uh, let Bonita explain. Sure. Might be might be better coming from her. Okay. Um, Sarah, yeah. re Sarah, remind me after I go through the wards that you want me to talk about um, zoning. So the ward system, I'm, I'm actually on an organization called Federation of Canadian Municipalities, and I, I meet with local elected officials ac across the country and there's many parts of the country where they have ward systems in cities so basically what it is is let's say for coquitlam it would be split up into six wards and someone would run for a ward rather than the whole city so let's say someone runs just for burke mountain and that that city councillor would be on council to represent just that portion of the city and so for Vancouver, they're talking about wards because it does, it's so big. And how do you go to the ballot and see, what was it like 72 uh, mayors or something ran last time? I might be making this number up, but you know, as a- as a, as a I think it was a really large number of people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it makes it, it makes it virtually impossible for the electorate to understand who's all running in the value system of all of them. So with wards, um, not that it applies to mayors, but with wards, the city councillors at least only represent one small area of the, the city or the, the municipality, the jurisdiction. Uh, I think it's a good idea. I, uh, many of my colleagues run in wards and I think it makes for better policy because there isn't the competition among councillors. You're doing the work for your constituents and their constituents, your colleagues constituents may also have the same. Bonita, you're cutting out again. 
in gold. So let me know when you get the. I think you're kind of back. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Great. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think the wards are really good because they 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 encourage collaboration rather than competition among counselors, and no one's looking for the sound bite of the day in the newspaper. So I like the idea of wards. Um, getting back to the zoning and the, you know, the, the acronym, the NIM or the NIMBYs, data is the great equalizer. In my opinion, data is the great equalizer. And if we had housing targets based on the demographics of our communities, we could defend as elected officials, as bureaucrats, we can defend those decisions with data. And it's the greatest missing gap in the work that I do, a total lack of data. So much subjective opinion, so many decisions made based on the pressure from a certain community group or someone that you know. I, I really think that if, if we could come with real data that says, look, I need to have 1,500 new townhouses in this area of the city to support these families with these compositions, I, I, I don't think you can argue that. And I think that until we bring data to the table as elected officials, we're going to continue to have these push and pulls, uh, NIMBY, YIMBY, SIMBYs uh, back and forth. And I, I'm really um, happy to hear the government has made us accountable going forward to, to bring some housing targets to them. But I still think there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Those are awesome. great points, thank you. I just wanted to uh, explain, I don't know if people are familiar with the acronym. So NIMBY stands for not in my backyard. It kind of historically refers to um, people in typically white affluent neighborhoods who, who oppose um, public housing or low-income housing um, in their neighborhoods. So this has been a long-standing fight in urban sort of development. Thank you. Actually, I wanted to ask you to elaborate on that. I'm glad you did it. Um, uh, before we get to Hesam, I want to just give Bernita uh, the, a little question to think of. Uh, what should be our takeaway from this session? Uh, you don't have to answer it now, but by the end of the session, I'd, I appreciate it if you can share your take, share, share the takeaway that we should have from your words and the discussion. So Hesam, all yours. Thank you. Um, just wanted to, uh, based on, uh, maybe I should start my video. Um, uh, so I think Taha knows me by the way. Uh, uh, so basically, my, I, I hear a lot about that the lack of data, both, I think probably the problem is both not having the raw data to uh, interpret it, and probably another aspect of it is, uh, as you said, uh, trying to advocate uh, database decision making. And then, uh, so like, I think part of this, uh, the fact that this is like a uh, part of the tech talk, uh, I think at least I was invited through the tech talk group. Uh, that like, and I see a lot of engineers here. Is that like how can we uh, maybe help or contribute to that problem? Or what is the problem? Why is there no data? Like, is there is there is there any data that is like uh, we can use and we are not using? Uh, are, are we lacking the statisticians, data scientists? Like, just kind of want to know what is the problem. And I know that part of it is that you, like, as a one person, a part uh, in uh, in the world of politicians, maybe there might be you might need more help for advocating that. But I know that I feel like this that's not the only problem. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Well, I can speak specifically to um, Coquitlam. Um, I think it's, it's a matter of resources, right? Data analysis takes a long time. Building business intelligence cubes takes a long time and expertise and money. And I think that the, like many organizations in the private world, cities are stretched. They are stretched to the max, right? Everybody is redlining. They're working so hard. We know housing is a huge issue. We're trying to pump out as much housing as we can get. 
and also to we you know we don't have endless budgets we're accountable to the community for the money that we spend so i think on the priority level um we're doing good right we're doing good enough the thing is we're now at a point where we need to do better because we've seen the equity we've seen how good enough is not addressing equity so i think that there needs to be a concerted uh, effort to find the resources, to allocate the resources. And the, like you said, the data is out there. It's just a matter of somebody's doing it off the side of their desk. And um, that, that can't be. And I think with this new census, this new census that we'll all go into, and I see Taha, you like census Taha, I think. I see you smiling at the census there. Um, we have an opportunity to do things differently. And it would be nice if the federal government invested in some data analysis at the highest level for us. But you know, we'd have to, we'd probably have to pick a topic. And I think it needs to be housing right now out here in, in uh in BC. But I think it's just a matter of resources. It's just day, I mean, everyone here knows that it can take it can take a day to put together two good slides of data. Awesome. Great answer. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Aysan. Yes, I have a question about Cuckoo Islam. I was wondering if there are any resources to support startups or uh, initiatives who want to support their communities, like uh, any initiative who wants to help the community-based activities. Is there any uh, uh, support in the city that we can apply for? So there is a chamber of commerce and I'm not sure if um, if you've if you visited or you've seen the local chamber of commerce, but that's one thing I did forget to mention that when I moved here, uh, the first thing I did was go on the city website to see if there was any jobs, not necessarily at the city, but just in general, a lot of cities post local jobs on their website, there wasn't so I ended up at the Tri-Cities Chamber of Commerce. And I think that is a good resource and it's worth tapping into them. Um, I do a lot of work with women. So there's the Women's Enterprise Center that do loans. They don't do grants, but they do loans, but it's another good um, network to have to, to tap into. And then BDC Business Development Canada the Business Development Canada office is in Coquitlam. It's right um, at the corner of Westwood and Lougheed Highway. Um, and I think they're moving soon, but there is that as well. Um, the city of Coquitlam has an economic development department and they have an in-house uh, office. It's called Business Link with a Q, link, L-I-N-Q. And they also are available for entrepreneurs and to get information. So I would definitely use Business Link as well, although you can't go in there in person right now because of COVID, but you could definitely phone. But I know there is, the, biz, the Chamber of Commerce is a good group to get connected to here and uh, they could use some Excellent. fresh voices. Thank you. And if we want to volunteer for any, because most of us like we have like full time job and we cannot contribute that much uh, to the city. But there are, are there any volunteer opportunities that you can you think that uh, we might be able to help or we might be able to contribute to? There's so many different, thank you for asking that. There's so many different agencies and organizations. So I should have brought my business card down here so that I could ask you to email me after. But if anybody wants to reach out on Facebook, find me or, or reach out to me after, let me know what you're interested in. Um, and I can definitely um, uh, align you or get, get you the names of some organizations if you're interested in housing, if you're interested in women, kids, food, security. Um, nature, environment, I can definitely uh, get you some contact names and eight organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Nilofar. 
Yeah. Oh my goodness, Bonita, you just uh, talked about all the subjects that uh, matters to me, and it was like I was just listening, and every every uh, topic that you opened, I was like, oh, this one, oh, this one, and that one, and then Taha introduced himself, and he he said that um, I wish there were more people like Bonita. So I was like, yeah. I wish, I really wish <laughs> there were more people like Vanessa in our uh, government. Um, yeah, the, the thing that uh, you were talking about, um, uh, that you have traveled uh, a lot of, um, you have to travel to a, lo a lot of places, and um, it, it, probably you have felt that it, it's, diff it's very, totally different, uh, that you go to a place as a uh, person from first world country, uh, like a contrary to the, you come here uh, from a third world uh, country to the first world. And so it's totally a different experience. But again, but again, you have touched some uh, like um, point, like uh, the angles of how um, people, the newcomers are um, uh, affected when they come to a new country and they don't know anybody and they need to, um, uh, make that network. I remember that uh, when I uh, came here, uh, when I arrived uh, five years ago here, uh, that they t people told me that, um, oh, if you have, uh, if you had children, then you could find uh, your network easier. And I was like, how can I find a child? <laughs> like <laughs> borrow somebody's child and go to one of these swimming lessons or <laughs> like the football. <laughs> uh, yeah. I re totally remember that, and I uh, understand what uh, you mean. And uh, another another part that you talked about uh, um, using local uh, resources. Um, I re now in COVID time, uh, I really feel that we really need to do that. But again, I I, I will see um, in some of the like BC government sometimes <laughs> uh, do. And another thing, like um, I work in Mosaic organization, the nonprofit which uh, helps um, uh, refugees and immigration immigrants to settle down, and uh, we have a very um, a magnificent translation and uh, interpretation department that uh, we got award for it, and uh, we're one of I can say I can really uh, say that. We are one of the top five organizations in BC that we're doing this. And then uh, because of this uh, virtual uh, uh, capacity that has uh, uh, opened, uh, the companies from East are taking our jobs. So it's like BC government find those uh, uh, prices uh, like cheaper because they are bigger organizations and they give their, their jobs uh, instead of giving it to, to us. And, they were our old uh, customers, like they were with us for a long time, like 10 years. Now they are going to uh, use uh, East companies. And that was shocking to me. Like, how come you're, you're saying that use local and we are the main local here and you're using the East organizations. Um, that came as a shock to me. And I really, <laughs> I was thinking that, oh, I wish Bonita was I governor or something. <laughs> so I really wish for that. Sorry, Amir. I said that. I know you, I know you don't. You, you, you like John more, but I like Bonita more now. Mm, I didn't say that. Uh, don't, uh, don't. Uh, I, okay. I never said that. Okay. And uh, so maybe I will move to Coquitlam to vote for you. <laughs> now I'm living in New West. So I will move to Coquitlam if I can find a place. And See, there's a reason I was resistant to recording these meetings. Now you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that was so interesting. I um, I think I, I, I was, I'm so interested um, in connecting with you and I have more talks. So thank you so much for uh, letting uh, us know that um, you're open to having this connection. Thank yeah. you so much, Manit. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. And, you know, thank you for that. And I, I hope we do have a, a secondary conversation, uh, but that you've just pointed out the importance of these procurement or purchasing policies that that government has, right? Um, we have 
we have in school district 43, which is the Coquitlam school district right now, it was in the paper last week or the week before that they, they, they purchased the bill, they, they built a new school and their, their, their overarching value statement for who they decided to hire to build it was, you know, the most affordable, the, the best price. And I think this is a conversation that governments need to have, local governments as well, is, you know, what is, what is the best price for the community? It might not be the cheapest price, but what's the best? Are, I mean, are they hiring local people? Are they supporting the local economy? And these are very um, important conversations that, that sometimes just making it cheap wins out and it's really unfortunate so i appreciate you sharing that because i you've just highlighted the importance of 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 government procurement uh, policies let's talk about the vaccine right now nationally right we we decided to sign contracts that sounds like didn't have prescribed delivery dates that didn't have these commitments in place and we decided to do um, external procurement and not invest or take a look at having vaccine made in Canada. Like these are such important um, value-based decisions that um, wouldn't necessarily hit a local government. And to your point, Amir, back where you were saying, what do local governments do now? But all of this is intertwined now. How are we supporting communities for, at all levels of government and I think procurement policies purchasing policies I mean you'll hear from every government yeah we there's a bid site it's called BC bid if anyone's ever not visited it the the um, government the, there is a government bid site called BC bid and they put out their um, their calls for um, investment or you know they, they put out their their jobs their contracts on there, you should take a look at it. But I mean, those are important, important things to a community. Uh, awesome. Uh, before we go to Mehdi, just F, just an FYI, Bonita, dinner seems to be ready and it looks delicious. Uh, I, Carlo posted pictures. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I told him exactly what he's supposed to make tonight. So I'll be judging it when I go upstairs later. Uh, yeah, and uh, please post your critique uh, because uh, if uh, Carlo uh, is a chef, uh, an inspiring chef, we would definitely want to know. Uh, okay, I'll Nancy. say no because there's some stories from my kids that they, yeah. Oh, okay. They were they were amazed that he made egos one day. So. Oh, lovely. <laughs> okay, uh, Mehdi, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, Lena. Uh, I enjoyed your talk very much. Uh, I myself am um, volunteering with the city of Maple Ridge uh, as much as I can. And uh, you touch based on something that is really close to my heart. And there's the, this contradiction between the economic development of the city and uh, the goal of most of the cities to uh, attract businesses and develop and uh, diverse their uh, economy and uh, the tax, their revenue. Uh, but the other side is that then you will be relying on those forces and those uh, influences of those businesses as well. And even with small cities like Coquitlam, Maple Ridge and these kind of things, uh, just a small, even, even medium-sized business can influence a lot on the bylaws and everything. So where do you think that sweet spot is? Like, uh, how do you balance these two kind of uh, uh, forces so that uh, the city can thrive as well as uh, and work for everyone from the businesses and the citizens? Mm -hmm. Well, that is a really... Um... Great question and a very complicated question. There's a lot of angles to come at. Um, I'm going to start on the tax angle first. So when, when the city budget is decided on, it needs to be allocated across residential and business, just on the very 
basic level. And I think one of the first things that cities need to do is determine what that split is going to be, right? 80-20 rule is a very common one, but is that split 80% of your budget is going to go to residential and 20% is going to go to a business or, or, or something like that. And I think that is, is a conversation that needs to happen because we have a lot of legacy residual decisions that were made you know, decades ago that perpetuate today and limit progress. Um, so there's that angle. But the other angle is, as you said, um, municipalities do want these larger businesses. They do like to be able to consolidate a tax base into, you know, these larger units for sure. And I think that it's, it's going to have to fall on the residents to express their values to their mayor and council and use their voting, their democratic voting power to let them know about those values. So what I mean about that is, you know, I think that the next generation or the current um, under 50s believe that the environment needs to have a larger portion of that pie of the decision making, right? I think that the environment is important to them, the quality of life, the health and wellness of their families and themselves. So I, I, I think that it's not an easy answer, but, and I know residents don't have a lot of time to invest in understanding who is it that's making decisions for them around the table. But I do think, I mean, I'm thinking about Maple Ridge, I mean, the, the council and the mayor, um, you know, they have a lot of ability to shape how that neighborhood evolves. And um, I think if they can, if I, I think the community can, can, let their voice be heard and let their voice be known on that. And it has to come through the vote of the community and it'll go, it'll go up and down and it'll move all around like we do in life, right? The wheel of fortune goes around. And right now, at this point in time, it's very important to get housing. Maybe, you know, a few more years from now, it'll be more important to get more business in. Like it's just, you need to be really on the pulse of what the community needs. But um, it's a really tough, it's a tough, equation for any local government and we can't just let business come in and um not have setbacks to do development where they can hurt the environment when they can where they can affect um irreparable changes to our environment and our, our health and our well-being that's for sure now i'm not sure if i if i answered so if there's something specifically you want me to speak to let me know Is there any specific one? Uh, no, there's not nothing specific, but there's a lot of talks like, uh, as you know, like Maple Ridge is growing really fast. Like now uh, the population has grown from Vancouver to um, New West and the Coquitlam in the past five, six, eight, eight, 10 years. And now it has reached Maple Ridge and like it, we are seeing a rise of the people coming to the city and the businesses as well, because now it's like, it is Maple Vancouver, like it's growing and growing and growing. And the Maple Ridge um, mostly is like farms and like local cities and it's more like a uh, small community. It was, they say. And now there's a lot of uh, intention to have more businesses and even factories, these kind of things. So it, it, there's all, all, all sort of uh, talks here and but my concern is like, where's that sweet spot? Because yeah, I guess like if there's a factory here, uh, it will contribute more taxpayers in the city and uh, maybe my tax on, on my property will be lower. But the thing is then what is my say in the city and how the city is going? So that's where my contradiction comes from. And, and that's so important what you're saying there. And I think I, I alluded to it earlier about how Coquitlam's growing so fast and it might be growing too fast for some. I mean, there's the human condition where change and, and, and change very quickly is really hard on our mental health. It's, it's actually not good for our, our well-being. And I think that there, that's why I, I, I believe so strongly in democracy and, and in the vote at the ballot box, because 
a community and I'm, you know, I'm going to go to the extremes to make an example, but you know, a community that's made up of people 70 years and older, should we be making high rise development and, and pushing those 70 year 70 and 75 and 80 year olds out of that community because we want to put up these high rises or do we take stock at a point in time and say, okay, this is, this is not good for the community now, but we know it's good for the community in the future. And I guess I would say the same thing about Maple Ridge is that, you know, that the community, if the community is not ready, they need to use their voice at the ballot box to say, we're not ready. And we as elected officials should be listening to that. Now we have to temper that with the realities of needed housing stock, needed jobs. But I do honestly believe in a democratic voice. And I, I, I I've joked to my colleagues before that, that council decisions will be taken over or can be taken over by AI. I mean, it could totally be an algorithm. Just look at all of the decisions that have been made over the last 10, 20 years, roll them up, put them on a spectrum of progressive to not progressive and let the computer spit out the votes. But I, I don't want our society to get to that. I want our society to have people that are living and experiencing in their communities, with their friends, their families, their pets, their food. And I want them to make the decisions at points in time. Awesome. Um, Although I want to run, I do want to run the parallel algorithm to see how closely it matches to the, uh, to the decisions that are coming out of councils and mayors. Awesome. Um, so one, any last uh, question or comment? Uh, and uh, we just have someone who just joined us, but uh, I, uh, I mean, that's fine. But uh, what anybody wants to have one last uh, question or comment before I ask mine and I ask Bonita for the takeaway? Yeah, the takeaway is opportunities are attached to people. So okay, that's easy. <laughs> meet as many of them and talk to as many of them as you can. I was a very late bloomer in that space. Opportunities are attached to people. Uh, okay, one last question, Bonita, and this is this probably opens a whole new can of worms. Uh, is uh, like uh, I'm asking you about your run federally because uh, we talked a lot about provincial, uh, sorry, municipal politics, but what made you uh think of doing that and making the jump and it seems that it's a thing in tri-cities at least uh 95 percent of the current uh, mps and mlas that i see uh they were at some point in civic uh government yeah well you know i think that civic government is a great um training ground right like it's a great it's like any any job like we start and we we go up the the steps or you know we move through the process and definitely local government you know it teaches you about process and protocol and bylaws but it also deeply connects you to the community and i think one of the one of the scary things that that um, you know, I worry about, and I definitely um, don't think it's a good idea. Is just to send people to Ottawa or Victoria that don't understand the people in their community, and you know, people joke, oh, you know, politicians always say they're door knocking. Yeah, I'm door knocking. I I know what people's um, you know pets are, where they live, what they're, what they make for dinner. Like I am, I think that sort of knowledge is very useful. Um, once you get to other levels of government, I see Fred there. Hi, Fred. Yes, Fred. Hello. Sorry. Fred. Sorry, I'm late. I was in other Zoom meeting. Yeah, Fred and uh, Amin, I guess, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they joined us. Uh, it's the last, uh, it's pretty much the end of the meeting, but if you guys want to say something, uh, feel free to introduce yourself, especially you, Fred. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself for our crowd? Who? Uh, your, uh, you, yourself, Fred. Oh, myself, yes. I'm, I'm Fred Sufi. I've been known Bonita for many years, and I think many years. 
Uh, so, uh, and she's a great person, great politician, great city councilor, and doing things for community. And I don't know what else I can say. And I would like to see more type of person like Bonita, who cares about community, about people, about environment, to to enter the politics. And I like to see some some. Uh, some Iranian, you know, Iranian Canadian who stand the politics. I don't know why they are there. You know, you have so many intelligent young people, you know, myself I did in 2011, but now I'm, you know, I'm 70 years old, so I don't want to enter the politics anymore. I'm doing some other thing. But I like Iranian, you know, some Iranian to enter the politics and to, you know, to, to just, I think Bonita agrees with me, don't you, Bonita? I do. Yeah. <laughs> So awesome. I hope somebody does, especially we need, you know, we need everywhere, like in Port Moody, you know, like Port Moody is ready for some changes. Uh, Coquelum too, you know, when, uh, when Bonita gets uh, elected to parliament, uh, then there is a vacancy there. So they should, they should enter, should get ready. Anyway. And Thank you, Fred, uh, and uh, just an FYI, uh, we don't know, Bonita hasn't confirmed uh, whether she's running or not. Maybe she can confirm now uh, for the next federal election. And uh, we'll Bonita is going to be, uh, uh, an, I mean, I'm sure Bonita uh, will be nominated for NDP to run. I mean, she was very close last time, she was very close. Mm -hmm. And this time she's right there. She is going to be elected. I'm, I'm 100%. I mean, not 100%. <laughs> close to 100% sure she will be. Uh, that was the, that was an anyway, interesting. Right. Anyway, yes. so. We were so close, right, Fred? 153 votes. Yeah, yes, yes. And, you know, that's politics. But yeah, the closest race in the country. The country, yeah. yeah. But I mean, I tell you, when I entered the, like, for the first time I, uh, I ran for the council, I was only 200 votes short. I like I had seven thousand two hundred votes, seven thousand three hundred, and I need the seven thousand five hundred. So I mean, yeah. So you can you can do it, and I don't see why not. And that was my first time. So I mean, second time usually more, you are more successful. So I think I encourage some young people come and enter. Okay, here's our next assignment for everyone in Kukwit, in Tri Cities, especially because that can happen. Uh, and before we end, I would like to also ask uh, Amin to introduce her, himself too, even though it's late, but I still want to thank you for coming. Uh, do you want to say a few words, Amin? Not sure if you can hear us. Uh, okay. Uh, Amin cannot hear us. So, yep. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we will continue these discussions and uh, the next uh, Tech Talk will be on Wednesday uh, with Marina Milner Bulletin when we're talking about science education. This will be fun. Uh, Marina is an instructor uh, at uh, uh, UBC, and she's going to have she's going to talk a lot uh, a lot about uh, science education. And also, um, please feel free to uh, invite your friends. We would love to have uh, new faces uh, coming to Tech Talk. Uh, and even though it's tech, it's TEK, so we cover different topics. Uh, don't be, uh, don't think that it's going to be always technology. And uh, one of our efforts here is to make bring uh, people like Bonita, elected officials, for us to get to know what they do and how they uh, the government and policy work is being done in different jurisdictions. And and I thank Bonita for explaining that. And we will have more of those uh, opportunities, uh, and uh, especially when it comes uh, election time, I'm sure that we will have more uh, discussion on that topic. And I'm not going to speculate. Uh, I have my own opinions, but uh, Tech Talk, uh, you know, is uh, where we discuss all ideas. And with that, uh, thank you, and have a great evening. See you all on Wednesday. It was so great to see all of you and meet you. Stay safe. Thank you. See All you out there. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much, Bonita, for joining us.